Everyone thinks that making a cinematic Hollywood professional level film is really hard, but it's not really that hard. What's really hard is learning how to talk to women. The whole list of what you need to do and need to know how to do and gear to have for making the most professional image you could possibly make with the bare minimum of spending money. These are the secrets to making any video look like a Hollywood movie. First up is equipment. First thing you're going to need is a camera, obviously. Um, preferably you're going to want a camera that can film in log, which is a flat profile. Um, if you don't have that, that's not a big deal. It's just that'll get you that little bit extra quality out of it. What I shoot on is the Canon R8. Basically you just want to be, you want a decent camera that can do decent things. You don't want to cheap out and get just a point and shoot camera. Preferably a camera where you can change out the lenses. Do some research, pick out the camera that has all the attributes that you want. Like if you want to film in 4K or not, or if you want to do low light photography or cinematography, your lens choices. The main lens you're going to want to get is a 50 millimeter f1.8. You're going to want a lens that can go really high in the aperture. So what I usually shoot at is f2.8. So like the background is blurry and then your focused is your focused subject is in focus. And then there's some other lenses you can get too that'll help with getting a good image like uh, getting different angles and things like that. Um, a wide angle and then a zoom lens would be preferred to have alongside the 50 mil but if you can only get one lens I would say just get the 50 with a good aperture so you can get all the different f-stops that you, you need for depending on the scenario. If not, arguably the most important thing is lights. Without lights, this scene would not be happening. So what I usually like to do is I have my key light right here. This one right here that usually is lighting up my face. I'll usually have it motivating a light that is, seems to be the main light in the film. So like if I'm sitting next to a lamp, I will match it to the same warmth of the lamp and I'll have it come from the same direction as the lamp. So it looks like it's coming from the lamp and it looks more natural. And then I also have uh, some other lights, like um, two lights over here for just creating some contrast, uh, some nicer colors to look at. So like the blue and then the orange coming in on my face, just to add some flair. Lights are a really important thing to have. I like to have a lot of them because if you don't have any lights, stuff like this scene right here, I would just have the light from above and I wouldn't really be able to do anything with that. It wouldn't look very good. But this way I can manipulate how I want my image to look before I even go into editing. The next important thing are mounts. Basically what I mean by mounts are tripods or magic arms. I have tripods for every single light in here, which is three, and then I have another tripod for the camera, which makes it four. And then I also have a magic arm, which allows me to attach my camera to pretty much anything and film like a POV of it. I also have a handle mount so I put on the camera so I can get smoother footage. And then there's also other things like a, a gimbal or something that I would consider a mount as well. Those are all really important for getting different angles and being able to film yourself and be able to get creative angles. So you don't need a whole lot of stuff. I would just get a, <clears throat> you can get cheap tripods for your lights and then just one decent tripod for your camera. And you can pretty much be good with that. Uh, there's also top handles, but that's not super necessary. It is very useful, but what I would say is necessary are just tripods for your lights and your camera. And then everything else is just like, depending on what kind of angle you want to get, you're going to end up wanting to get that mount for that angle. Equipment you're going to want to have is microphones. Audio is half of the video. If you have a video and the audio is bad, no one's going to keep watching. So you're going to want to invest into something that is decent audio so people won't want to click off immediately because it's hurting their ears. The microphone I'm using right now is the Rode wireless mic. And that's pretty much the only thing you need. You can get also a shotgun mic to put on there if you don't want to set up the, all the wireless microphone stuff. That's pretty much all I use is a shotgun mic and then these. Step two is putting all that gear together and setting up everything. Main settings you're going to want to think about on your camera are the ISO or ISO, however you want to say it, the aperture, and then the shutter speed, and then also frame rate and some other stuff. But the three main things for getting a good looking image is frame rate, ISO, and aperture. So aperture, it varies. You can be really creative with it. You can do whatever you want. Um, typically in the movies you're gonna see 80% of the time it's gonna be like f2.8 ish cinema cameras go off of like the t-stop which is different and you have to like calculate it with the, each lens and everything so basically when you're doing a talking like a you know person's face or something you want people to focus in on 
Specifically, you're gonna want a lower f-stop so it blurs out the background and it forces the viewer to pay attention to it. Sometimes you're gonna do a wide open shot and you want multiple things in focus though. So that's when you would have a higher f-stop. So depending on your situations, if you don't have a ND filter or proper lights and everything, then you're gonna want to adjust that to make sure the image still looks good. Um, the ISO is basically your camera's sensitivity to light. So the higher the number, the brighter the image will be, and the lower the number, the darker it'll be. But keep in mind, the higher the ISO, the more noise you'll be introducing into the, the camera. Um, and then also, a lot of cameras have base ISOs. So for my camera, when I'm filming, my base ISO is 800. Other cameras will be different. Make sure you understand which number it is for that camera so you can get the best quality image. Um, sometimes you're gonna wanna shoot up the ISO because it's too dark and you don't have enough lights or you don't have any lights, that's okay. There's also editing software out there that'll denoise stuff. Just try not to have too much noise because denoising software can only go so far. Shutter speed is basically how fast the, the shutter is going. So shutter speed, basically for video, you want it to be one over double what your shutter, your uh, frames per second is. So what I would usually film in is 24 frames per second. So my shutter speed is one over 50. So one over double what you're filming frame rate wise. And then frame rate, you want it to be, usually movies will film at 24 frames per second. Uh, you can do 30 frames per second, or you can do 120 frames per second if your camera will let you, or 60 frames per second. 24 and 30 frames per second are going to be your regular filming, not slow-mo basically. 24 and 30 is regular speed. Um, you can do slow-mo in 30 frames per second if you slow it down to like 80% and then match it in with a 24 frames per second timeline. And you can get a little bit of slow-mo that way and not have to to sacrifice light because the faster the shutter speed the darker it'll be 60 frames per second is good for slow-mo and then if you want to do a really slow really really slow slow-mo 120 or higher is pretty good for that picture profiles so picture profiles are basically kind of like a color grade that your camera applies to the image that you're taking regular picture profiles basically just does the base adjustments just to make it look like how it, you're seeing it in real life what I like to film in is log that is a super flat profile where it's, you know, just everything is all the shadows and the highlights and everything is just in the colors just smushed down. So basically it's really flat and then you go and take it into color grading and you spread it out more and then you bring it all all the color and the highlights and the shadows back into the image. If you start from a long profile, you can stretch it out however you want instead of just what the the picture profile does with the, its own sort of LUT. You have more freedom and more control over how you want the image to look. If you underexposed it, you can fix it easier than if you underexposed it on a regular picture profile. A lot of cameras won't have a log profile, so if you, if you really care about getting the most out of your image, you're gonna want a camera that does have a log profile, but it's not a necessity, and you can also kind of fake it if you go into your camera's picture profiles, you can go and just make it as flat as possible. All right, so now we've set, we got all our gear, we set up the camera and set everything up to the correct settings. So now we're actually in the process of filming our film. So if, if you've noticed a lot of movies and you pay attention to all the angles and the cuts and everything, there's, it's cutting constantly. What you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna film different angles, which is why different lenses will come in handy, but you don't need different lenses in order to get different angles and different uh, compositions. How I like to do it is I like to start off with some close-up shots and then a wide shot and then a medium shot. And then I like to get like a POV shot or something like that. So I have a magic arm so I can clamp it onto like a lawnmower and then I can get a POV shot of the lawnmower. So that helps a lot with getting a variety of shots. If you just, you know, film my face, like I'm sitting here and it's just my face the whole time, you're just gonna get bored. You have to have cuts and different angles angles and stuff like that to keep the viewer interested to make sure that they are enjoying the film and they're not getting bored. I'm not saying you can't have
have the same shot two times in a row, like a close up and then a close up or a wide and another wide angle, but you're gonna wanna change it up and you're not gonna wanna do the same thing over and over and over again. So just make sure you're thinking of new angles and new ways to have a new compositions when you're filming and stuff and try to be creative with it. Basically, you're just, you're gonna wanna make sure you're keeping it moving. You're not, not having any stagnant areas where it's nothing's happening, there's no angle changes or anything. Try to do matching shots where there's an action happening. So like, if I'm going like that, you take a shot of this, and then you do another angle of the same shot and then you match them in editing to make it flow a little bit better. That's something you wanna keep in mind when you're filming. You can't really make those shots without thinking of it beforehand. So make sure you think of what you want to do with the image before so when you're filming you can make it as easy as on yourself as possible. So you have your video and it's all filmed and all of it's on your camera and you get it into your computer and now it's editing time. You wanna chop out everything you don't want and throw it away and then you wanna have just the clips that you're gonna end up using and put them in order of how you want them to happen basically and then you watch it through and you make sure everything looks good and is cut properly and is to your liking next I usually like to do the sound design so sound design what I like to do is a lot of editing software has their own sound effects that you can import so if you're filming with Final Cut Pro or if you're editing with Final Cut Pro they have their own sound library for sound effects and then same thing for DaVinci Resolve and then I don't know about Premiere Pro but I'm sure they do. If you need music, that's a little bit harder. I pay for a subscription to have a license to use music on YouTube. YouTube also has their own music you can use on your videos, but it's just not very good. You can use it if you want and go listen, go to YouTube and go and find it. There's like a whole section in the editor area and you can find some music there, but it's just not the best compared to the paid services. But if you don't have money, that's a great place to go. When you're going to edit the sound and you're putting sound effects in, it doesn't have to be the exact sound for what you're doing. Turning your camera on or putting the lens on or something like that, if you're filming that, you can put other sounds over it. As long as it kind of sounds like it probably would fit, most people's brains will just tell them that it makes sense. And that gives you more freedom when you're looking through the sounds to put overlay it in places on your video. The different types of cuts you're gonna to wanna to know about when you're editing is there's the J cut, the J cut and like the L cut or whatever where the audio bleeds into the other clip. You have one scene and then the audio from the next scene is bleeding into it before it actually happens. It is a great way to make your scene less jarring when you change or vice versa where you want the same the scene that you're watching to bleed over into the next clip. I like to do that whenever there's like a door closing or something like that. It'll close and over go over into the next clip. You can move into the next clip and not have it sound like the door just cuts right there. And then of course there's the match cut, which is what we talked about earlier, where you're matching the movement from another movement and continuing the motion. And then that's, a, that's another scene where you'd want the audio to bleed over into the next video because then it sounds more like they're hearing the sound as it's happening so it makes it make sense to their brain. And then the last thing, the icing on the cake is color grading. So if you filmed your video in a regular color profile, you can skip this step, but if you filmed in log, you're gonna to need to convert it back to Rec. 709, which is the basic color profile. There's a few different ways of doing this. You can get a LUT or in uh, DaVinci Resolve, there's a color space transform that'll just convert it right away. So diff there's different log profiles as well. So that I'm filming on C log three. You're gonna want a LUT that'll transfer it from C log three. But what I like to do, instead of getting a LUT or a color space transform, I like to just start the color grade from the very beginning. And I like to go and adjust the shadows to where I want them and the highlights to where I want them and then the saturation to where I want it. So I have more control over it that way I feel like. Um, you have a scope on the ed your editing software that shows where the highlights and the shadows and the midtones are at. And you want the shadows to be just, just above the bottom before they clip, like just above zero. And then the highlights, you want it to be just below the clipping point, which is the top of the, there's, it's just some random number at the top. I don't remember what it looks like. So basically when you start color grading and you're in log, it's gonna start in the middle. Everything, the shadows and the highlights are gonna be right down the middle. You wanna stretch them out. And once they're stretched out to where they're 
where it's good. That's basically Rec 709. Um, you're basically you just want to take the saturation and boost it up to wherever you think it looks good. You don't want it too saturated though because then it'll look weird. But basically just look at it and decide, you know, set it. You can be pretty creative with the saturation. There's a lot of movies out there that'll desaturate their video and it looks pretty good. I would just suggest going a little bit further with the contrast, making the shadows a little bit darker and the highlights a little bit higher and everything because that just looks better with low saturation than having just low saturation. So once you have all that set to where you want it, you can kind of start the color grade now, which I like to go and go into the shadows. You just add blue and or teal and a lighter, a cooler color. And then I also like to go and mask out the skin and then switch to the vector scope, which is a, it's like the circular scope. And then there's a line on there that shows where the skin tones are supposed to be at. So when I I will mask out the skin tones and I'll just adjust them a little bit just to make sure it go is perfectly on the skin tones. If you're doing a color grade and you're in the desert and then the whole thing is like kind of orange, you don't want the skin tones to be completely perfect because then it you, you still want your skin to be affected by the surroundings of the image. So you don't need the skin to be perfectly on that line all the time. It kind of depends on what you're filming and what the context of the image is. And so pretty much all the gear I use is in the description and if anything you see you like, you wanna grab it, then just go click on that and it'll take you straight to it. I hope you enjoyed it and if you want a more in-depth video on how to color grade, then I have one right here and we will we'll see you in that one if you choose to click on it.